Vladimir Putin was born in St. Petersburg during the early 1950s. Although baptized as a child, it wasn't until the 1990s where, after an experience involving a burning house, he returned to the Russian Orthodox Church after the urging of his mother. A few years later, he would become the President of Russia and quite possibly the most important man so far this millennium. But his faith has become a point of speculation, especially in light of recent events. This raises an interesting question. What is the theology of Vladimir Putin? Disclaimers. This video isn't an analysis into the current conflict in Ukraine. If you want a breakdown of every military action, this isn't the video. Personally speaking, I am struggling to verify anything I've been told about Ukraine and Russia this past month. I'm making this video because there are many misconceptions floating about Vladimir Putin, history, and the Russian Orthodox Church. I am neither Russian or a Russian Orthodox, or even Eastern Orthodox, and I implore anyone who's either of those to share their perspective. Also, I kind of feel a bit creepy making this video. One's connection with God is an intensely private matter even if you are the president of Russia. Much of this video explores the historical roots of Putin's actions and philosophy, but some parts are left to speculation. Does Putin really believe? It's not uncommon for those outside of Russia to question whether Putin is actually Christian. The reasons for this doubt are very understandable. If you strongly oppose Putin on moralistic grounds, this may contradict your image of modern Christianity as mostly opposed to violence. There's a temptation to deem Vladimir Putin as unchristian due to intense emotions of disgust, fear and sadness one feels towards him. Even if a Christian concedes that Putin is a true believer, there is an impulse to say that he's not a true Christian. But this is misguided, as his actions have clear theological roots. There's also an unfortunate trap, which I must caution against, where believers must prove how religious they are by fitting into certain moral norms. While it's normal, even essential, to require a consistent theology, and worldview from those who call themselves believers, it is quite unreasonable to demand conformity. History is not alien to disagreements within Christianity, and it's possible for the Moscow Patriarch to praise Putin just as it is for the Pope to disagree. Both are still Christian. The second reason why Putin's faith is disputed deals with political opportunism. His moments of faith came in the 90s, and soon had become president of Russia. Whilst it's certainly true that after the fall of the Soviet Union, many Russians did convert or return to the Orthodox Church, part of this was fueled by a nostalgia of a pre-revolutionary Russia. But the country experienced huge declines in economy, society and power. This catastrophic situation explains the turn to religion. However, there's a risk in assuming that the Soviet Union completely abandoned the Orthodox Church for its entire existence. Rather, the return of the Orthodox Church was decades in the making, brewing in World War II. Under Nazi invasion, Joseph Stalin's Russia used the iconography of St. Alexander Nevsky as a motivating 
uniting figure. For those who don't know who the saint is, Saint Alexander Nevsky is a Russian medieval saint who fought off Estonian and German invaders during the 13th century. To this day, he is venerated as one of, if not the most beloved Russian in all of history. Although Soviet policy was definitely antagonistic towards religion, this slowly changed, often depending on nationality and situation. It's really hard to find a consistent practice by the Soviet Union towards religion. My point is, the revival of the Orthodox Church in Russia didn't come out of nothing. P Putin, as a Russian, was shaped by these historical forces. Instead of picturing the Russian president as a shadow lurking and manipulating in the sidelines, we should depict Putin as an active participant and shaping force in Russia. Also, Russia is home to many Muslims and atheists, a significant portion who supports Putin. Ultimately, I believe religion can only take a leader so far in politics, and there is no guarantee of support by believers. Whilst Putin definitely benefits from the Russian Orthodox Church's support, it's still a wild claim that Putin is just an opportunist with no commitment to the faith. The Third Rome Theory This is both a theological and political concept that positions Moscow, the capital of the Russian Federation, as the heir to Rome and Constantinople. This idea, however, didn't come from Russia. Rather, it came from Bulgaria where parts had fallen to the Ottoman Empire in 1383. When Constantinople eventually fell, Moscow was again nominated by various Eastern Orthodox adherents as a possible Third Rome. During this time, the Grand Prince of Moscow emerged as the strongest ruler of the Orthodox tradition. This increased the appeal of Moscow as a beacon of Christianity. The notion of looking to Moscow for guidance and faith is absolutely crucial to understanding Putin's theology. Historically, an important concept within Russian thought is that of the Holy Rus. This land represents more than any other as the kingdom of heaven which is governed by God. According to the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is a process where God manifests in the world of men. This is contextualized through governance and kingship, two crucial concepts in understanding any Russian leader. From this, we can see something fatherlike and paternal about Russia, which, to someone like Putin, is more than a nation on a map, but a civilization. It's important to acknowledge Putin's nostalgia for the Russian Empire, with particular preference for both Peter I and Catherine the Great. This is a man who is clearly concerned with history and its urgency, in a way that's quite remarkable. Much of Vladimir Putin's reforms and ambitions deal with restoring Russia to greatness in the 21st century. This is completely understandable, because nations must remain competitive and a leader should want his people to thrive. In a more realist geopolitical sense, Putin wants Russia to have influence, and it's not too far-fetched to conclude that he's after spiritual or religious influence. After all, the Third Rome theory positions Moscow as a religious center, enlightening our lives. The extent of the Russian church's ambitions remain unclear. In 2009, the Patriarch Kirilli of Moscow positions Eastern Orthodoxy with Russian culture and language. To the Patriarch, these citizens have a historical memory, regardless of if they live in Belarus or Ukraine. According to Vladimir Putin's essay in 2021, the Ukrainians and Russians are one people. 
This draws on the Viking history of the Rus, who were baptised under St. Vladimir the Great. Although there are certain Western and Byzantium influences in the Russian Orthodox Church, we must note the Russian flair that is being given. Liberalism and the West Мы видим, как многие евроатлантические страны фактически пошли по пути отказа от своих корней, в том числе и от христианских ценностей, составляющих основу западной цивилизации. Отрицаются нравственные начала и любая традиционная идентичность, национальная, культурная, религиозная или даже половая. Проводится политика, ставящая... The dynamic between Putin and Western leaders is subject to constant scrutiny from think tanks, journalists and peers. Yet, the Russian president has a clear perspective of America, France and other significant Western powers. In my opinion, this is why some Westerners like him. Because he's a sharp critic of the West's many follies. Although, Russia's tensions with Western powers goes back hundreds of years. There is a special emphasis needed on liberalism, a core value expressed by France and England, which eventually evolved into various progressive movements, globalism in political theory, and economic freedoms. The bastion of liberalism became the United States of America after World War II. Although the Soviet Union was America's enemy during the Cold War, you had an increasing American or liberal influence in Russia, especially in the 80s and 90s. Therefore, when Russia's power dwindled in the 1990s, America and the West grew stronger. But what was going on in the West? Religious power, especially that of Christians, slowly declined. If you compare religious identification in the United Kingdom in 2020, you'll get a very different statistic than 40 years ago. Therefore, Russia's revival of religion didn't really occur in the West. Over the course of Putin's rule, he would meet Western Prime Ministers and Presidents, even visiting these countries. He would witness the results of American hegemony and deem it as an empire of lies. Certain events over 20 years, such as warfare in Syria, the expansion of NATO and the Ukrainian revolution in 2014, would have intensified this viewpoint. Much of this is in the realm of geopolitics, not theology. Yet, Alexander Dugin, a contemporary Russian philosopher, attributes liberalism and democracy as the result of religious decline in the West to both Dugin and Putin. That makes liberalism horrifying. The West, as Putin has expressed, has severed its moral and spiritual roots in Christianity. Much of contemporary Western thinking on human rights, progressivism, obligations and foreign affairs must strike Putin as extremely abnormal. He clearly does not want the same fate for Russia because Putin recognises that Russia and other Western countries have very similar moral and spiritual roots, concentrating on Christianity. Out of all the world leaders, Vladimir Putin is probably the most intense critic of the West's impulse. And this is for a very specific reason. Because he could have joined them. He could have joined the Liberals and turned Russia into a beacon of neoliberalism. And in the start of his ruling, that possibility was definitely waved around. But he didn't. And as Dugan says, the Western political class never forgave him for that. Although one can find the Moscow Patriarch's comments about gay pride parades offensive, as well as any legislation done under Putin against LGBT activities and rights, you have to understand how incompatible these things are to many outside of Western Europe and the Anglosphere. Russia never experienced 
liberalism or secularism like the Anglosphere did. It's true that Enlightenment ideas had some influence in Russia, as seen under the rulership of Catherine the Great, and intensified during the Soviet Union, where the antagonism was extreme towards religion. This is different to America, which was founded on liberal ideas of freedom, equality, and separation of the church and state. Therefore, Russia's relationship with religion and liberal ideas will differ. From Putin's perspective, embracing Western notions of democracy, liberalism, and progressivism will lead to the collapse of the Russian civilization, a position of violence. A sovereign is ultimately responsible for his people and the civilization he reigns over. He must think in a paternalistic way, as both a defender and a warrior. This often means, for some countries and leaders, committing violent acts, which can range from murder to warfare. Yet, this clearly poses a challenge for Christians, as God's commandments speak specifically against such behaviour. After the death of Christ, Christians faced persecution under the Roman Empire and were hardly represented in positions of power. But this changed. Constantine the Great, the first Roman Empire to convert to Christianity, made it the official religion of the Empire. He also created Constantinople. But there was a problem. Tribes gathered on the Roman frontiers consisting of Franks and Goths or Barbarians. There were internal threats inside the Empire too. Constantine had to use violence, but he lacked the theological justification to do so, as Christians were seizing as a persecuted minority and were becoming emperors and kings. The writings of many church fathers preaching pacifism was not going to work at all. And later, you can see Charlemagne and various Russian Tsars dealing with this as well. Thus, Christian rulers needed a theology consistent with leadership or a rationale for violence. Over a thousand years, various theologians theorised about warfare and punishment. Notable ones include St Thomas Aquinas and St Augustine although there were definitely disagreements among Christians. But, of course, the Russian Orthodox Church does not represent all of Christianity. To discover a possible rationale for Putin's violence, one needs a nuanced understanding of not only religion, but how we make decisions. Even if an action can be justified with an interpretation of theology, doesn't make it easy or even correct. Even if Putin stands by every single choice he's made in his life, there is surely a slimmer of doubt or questioning. Of course, this complicates the investigation into his theology as nothing is 100% clear. But I must emphasize the position Putin is in. He is not only a follower of Jesus Christ, but the president of Russia. And please keep in mind that Russia is the largest country in the world with over 190 ethnic groups, has been invaded throughout its history and shares borders with so many different countries. This results in many security risks. He must maintain loyalty through both. This is a sharp contrast to, say, Joe Biden, the current president of the United States. America has a long tradition of secularism, and Biden, a Catholic, will not frame his policies and attitudes in such religious terms. Suffering. A common cliche about Russian literature is that it's dark, depressing, and dreary. Although this stereotype is not entirely fair, there is some truth in it. 
Some of the greatest writers of the Russian language, whether Tolstoy, Grossman, Pushkin, Dostoevsky, or Solzhenitsyn, deliver characters who experience profound suffering. Many outside of Russia, especially in English-speaking countries, attribute this focus on suffering to the brutal hardships faced by Russians. There are many multiple reasons to believe this. Russia has experienced many foreign invasions since the arrival of the Rus. We could discuss the Golden Horde, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Napoleon or Nazi Germany for a while. Yet, geography also contributes to Russia's anxiety in sharing borders with so many countries. Both Moscow and St. Petersburg are in vulnerable positions, strategically speaking. This point is relevant and difficult for Australians, Americans, British individuals to grasp, as geography tends to work in the Anglosphere's favour. Because of this uncertainty, as well as other crucial historical factors, Russia has an extensive philosophy on suffering. Please note that I don't mean to cast Russia as a place of unrelenting misery, because I don't believe that. Rather, I want to focus on how Russians responded to these circumstances in their theology and literature. Although suffering is not unique to Russia, the civilization has a unique interpretation of it, especially compared to Western European traditions. To someone like Vladimir Putin, the Russian Orthodox Church has been a consistent source of strength for over a thousand years in the face of suffering. A light among darkness, so to speak. Yet, neither Putin, Dostoevsky or Solzhenitsyn call for the conquest and annihilation over suffering. To them, it's a part of life and can't be avoided. In notes from the underground, Dostoevsky proclaims, Only through suffering can we find ourselves. Some writers, such as Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn, position Russia as accepting of suffering. In the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn contributes his eventual enlightenment to the Gulag, the cold Siberian labour camp provided the ultimate teacher and friend. As the Nobel Laureate says, Bless you, prison. Bless you for being in my life. For there, lying upon the rotting prison straw, I came to realise that the object of life is not prosperity, as we are made to believe, but the maturity of the human soul. This is an essential part of the Russian Orthodox Church as it evokes theosis. Also known as theification, theosis is interpreted by some theologians in the Eastern Orthodox Church as the purpose of life. The core purpose of theosis is unity with God. However, Christianity positions Christ in all humans, as Jesus Christ embodies both the holy God and sinful man. Although Orthodox Christians do view Jesus Christ as completely free from sin, it's simplistic to portray the Russian Orthodox Church's believers, including Putin, as endlessly self-righteous and ignorant of their own sins. But I can see why some Americans have this stereotype, as some religious preachers in their country, although clearly not all, demand total purity and conformity for God's acceptance. However, Theosis makes no promise of complete liberation from sin while alive. Even when the individual reaches unity with Christ, he or she is not free from feelings of abandonment and doubt. Yet, this can strengthen the soul further to Christ. This is relevant to how Russian Orthodoxes, like Putin, contextualize their history. It's a long narrative, spanning over a thousand years, full of trials like Soviet oppression. Yet it's through catharsis 
and the gradual purging of vices, that one comes closer to the light. After all, the rise of the Russian Orthodox Church is matched with Russia's recovery from the fall of the Soviet Union. Putin is clearly an ambitious man who, according to some Russians, not only helped Russia recover from economic, political and social decline, but brought the soul of Russia closer to salvation. A holy war. A common interpretation of Christianity is that it's peaceful. There are very valid reasons to think this, due to compelling church teachings, scripture and actions from saints since the birth of Christ. However, we must not confuse peace with passiveness, meekness, complacency or submission. Throughout the history of Christianity, rulers were responsible for war and peace within their sovereign lands. Ultimately, Putin is responsible for the power he wields and failure to use this power results in others seizing it for barbaric purposes. One who knew this very well was St. Augustine. According to him, peacefulness in the face of a grave wrong is a sin. This is articulated in the City of God. According to Putin's theology, he must not remain passive in either Syria or Ukraine. Although a Christian can object to his methods on the basis of morality, that's certainly true. Yet Putin clearly felt an intense moral duty to Donbass, Crimea and to denazify Ukraine. This also explains Putin and Kirill's religious framing of warfare. Certain religious iconography and biblical quotes have been evoked by Putin in the past few weeks. Speaking of which, a new cathedral has opened in the Moscow Oblast for the armed forces. It's only a few years old, but it's gained much attention to outsiders, especially those opposed to Putin. It is a celebration of warfare, yet I believe it contextualizes the military with the Russian Orthodox Church. Other countries do this too, especially the United Kingdom. Anyone who's visited Westminster Abbey can attest to that. This is because for much of the history of Christianity, it has been widely accepted that there are justifications for warfare. Just war theory stems from this, and there are two concepts you must know. The right to go to war, named just ad bellum. The right conduct in war, also known as just in bello. War is clearly terrible, but it's not always the worst option possible, according to just war theorists. The Russian Orthodox Church has a specific doctrine on on warfare's morality, as proposed in the basis of the social concept. There's this notion that warfare has always existed from the Garden of Eden and will continue to occupy humanity. Yet, this doesn't mean the church doesn't condemn aspects of warfare. It's undesirable, but sometimes necessary for the security of neighbours and the restoration of trampled justice. There's also the crucial concept of spiritual warfare, where the individual must battle sin and temptation throughout his life. This explains why Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn emphasize the maturity of the soul as man fights more battles. The reality is that fighting sin is an active choice. It requires decisions and the ability to assert one's will on others. Goodness according to someone like Putin, does not come out of passive or accepting behaviour. You do not become good by tolerating evil. This is a sharp contrast to many in the West, who associate goodness with meekness. However, the Russian Orthodox Church is not oblivious to Western Christian thinking on warfare, as theology from, say, St. Thomas Aquinas is incorporated into the doctrine of the Russian Orthodox Church. Conclusion 
There's a danger in assuming that all Russian Orthodox followers are the same in regards to theology and political science. I am not interested in creating a trap for the Russian Orthodox Church where nothing will ever change or be challenged. As I've articulated, the Russian Orthodox Church evolves alongside Russia and any Tsar-like figure, including Putin. The theology and literature from adherence to the Russian Orthodox Church will not only respond to timeless theological concerns, but also the history and culture of Russia. As Dostoevsky argues, the Tsar embodies the Russian people, their hopes and dreams. That's the theology of Vladimir Putin, to save, defend and resurrect the Russian soul. Thank you for watching and I hope this video illuminated necessary light on the Russian Orthodox Church. If you have any thoughts or suggestions, please comment them below.